there are more children out there than this. Good, there's more coming. Last week I was so glad when Mr. Hughes got up here and told his story about Alaska because I had so many stories in my head. But when he told that story, I had to tell you my story about Alaska. There are so many things in Alaska that are exciting. At night, you know, there are lights that dance in the sky. Northern lights, that's right. But I want to tell you about the tundra. Do you know what the tundra is? I'm going to show you. Tundra is like moss, like this, and you can pass that around and feel it. You can feel it. It's clean and dry. You can feel it. Come here. Just don't pull it out of the bag because it'll make a mess. Now you feel how dry it is? Yeah. yeah. It's really spiky. Yes, it is spiky. Right, and you know when it gets really, really dry? It gets spiky. Mm. But there's another thing. The tundra can get up to two or three feet deep. It grows on top of ice. Now, I want you to smell this bunch. Put your nose up to it and smell it. You don't have to touch it. Smell it. What's that make you think of? Pine trees. Mm -hmm. I smell that at and my house. And Christmas trees. Here. Oh, I don't take them out. At my house. Yes. It smells like garbage. No! <laughs> it smells like trees, doesn't it? Smell that. Doesn't that smell nice? Okay. We mined in Alaska a long time ago. For you, it was even before you were born by a long time. To get to our mining camps, you came off a main road, you drove 90 miles across a gravel road, went to the top of a hill, parked your cars, and you walked five miles across the tundra. Down a hill in the bottom of a creek bottom, and that's where our camp was. Can you imagine walking across two feet of this and it grew in great big clumps and so you had to kind of walk from clump to clump to clump five miles down this hill to get to our cabins and there were 25 people that lived there. Couldn't quite slide because, what? It was awesome to live there because at night you had these lights dancing in the sky, and you got to see grizzly bears, and you got to see wolves, and you got to see caribou and moose. And you know, it was nice that was there. There were seven kids in our camp. Seven kids that lived in camp. In this camp, there was kind of a trail that went by, and there were miners that worked in a, a creek on the other side. And whenever they'd go through, they'd always stop because we worked in the kitchen. They didn't have a cook at their camp, and they'd always stop at mealtime. Well, one day something very funny happened. These miners on the other side came rushing through, headed back towards town, and they didn't stop. And I thought, that's kind of funny. They were going so fast. They had kind of a four-wheel drive dune buggy. And the one guy standing on the back, his coat was flying out behind him like this. Didn't even stop to have a cinnamon roll or anything. And I thought, wow. And then pretty soon, we could smell smoke in the air. And you know, on the tundra, it's never good to smell smoke. And then the next thing, here came this funny guy running down into camp. And it was a native smoke jumper. 
And those are the guys that jump out of planes for parachutes. And no guns, no. What they usually have are shovels and pickaxes so that they can put out fires. But this guy came in and he says, there's a fire up there. And I jumped out and they tested the wind and it was supposed to be okay. But when I jumped out, the wind changed. I lost my parachute. I lost my backpack. I lost all my equipment and it's coming this way. And you know, by then we could look clear up on top of the hill and here came the fire. And this fire was coming so fast well, you know, 23 of us went across the creek and up on the other hill. Two of the guys got out our big cat. Now, this is a cat that has a blade on the front of it, 12 feet wide. 12 feet. That would be two six-foot men standing end to end. That's how wide that blade was. And these guys made two great big passes above our camp thinking, you know, if they take all that tundra away, then that fire can't come down that hill and burn up our camp. Well, you know what? Those flames were 20 feet high. 20 feet, and they jumped right over that first trail. Whoa! Here we are over there on the other side of the creek, and we're thinking, it made it over one. What's it going to do if it makes it over the second one? Well, sure enough, Ralph and Joe are trying their best to make sure it doesn't get into camp because if it burns up camp, there we are stuck on the tundra with no clothes, no food, no nothing. But you know something? Jumped right over trail number two and here are those flames coming just as fast as they can. Well, you know, there are 23 of us over on that side and pretty soon my son, little Joe, who's 12, says, Mama, we haven't prayed. And you know, we didn't. We were so afraid, we forgot to pray. And you know, all 23 of us bowed our head. And young Joe prayed to God that he would stop that fire. How do you think that God could stop that fire? Yes, he could. And so young Joe said, Dear Jesus, please stop the fire because we need to have a place to live. And he said, Amen. And you know what happened in that instant? A wind came up and it was so fierce. It was blowing against the back of us. So we're looking at that fire. It blew the fire out down in our creek. You could see it in that instant. It didn't wait a minute. It was right then. And I tell you, that fire had burned up 600 acres. And you know, never forget when you're in trouble or you need help to pray. But every morning, start the day with prayer. Jesus, help me through this day. That's your story, and thank you for being so good today. You may go back now. If you'd like to come forward at this time, that'd be great. Um, if, you're, if you're more comfortable sitting, standing, or kneeling, you can go ahead and do that. But I'll just give a couple seconds for everyone to get down here, and we'll have a prayer. Would you bow your heads with me? God, you are the one who stands in the fire beside us. You're with us during the hard times we're going through and just everything we're dealing with, Lord. And, and God, so many of us are in here today. We came to this, to this building to worship you. And we could have done so many other things today. And 
And we all came in the doors with, with different things going on in our lives, struggling with different things. And Jesus, I just want to pray that, that every single one of us in here would experience your love and your grace and your forgiveness and your peace, Lord. If someone's going through something, I just want to pray that you would, would, would give them peace right now, Lord. Jesus, I want to pray for my friend, Rick, as he's going to bring the word this morning. I just ask that your Holy Spirit would, would just empower him, Lord. He's got a great message to share. and Just speak through him. Open our hearts and our minds to his message. You're, you're amazing, God, and, and we love you so much. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen. Guys, I don't want you to feel left out. I mean, maybe you have felt excluded and, and cheated in life. Uh, guys, I, I, I have a liberating message for you today. Uh, perhaps you didn't even realize how much you had been left out in the past. Uh, how, how many of you perhaps secretly have longed for beautiful feet but listen, I bring you good news. I bring you good news. It is now fashionable to have, for guys to have pedicures, okay? And, it, and, and I, just, I just wanted you to know that you too can have beautiful feet. Yes. There's no shame in this, guys. I mean, good, good feet are just really, really so important. Yeah, are you ready? But you know, the truth is that there is a spiritual application of beautiful feet that I want to talk about today. I, I want to talk about this, and it's, it's an important and incredible message because it was, it, it was something that was going on in the first century church. The church had come alive. That, that after the resurrection of Jesus and Pentecost, in, in the book of Acts, it starts... It just starts unveiling huge, huge revelations of God's power through the Holy Spirit being, being just let loose, and, and the church was growing rapidly. And, and we're told this story that Peter and John were headed to, headed to the temple courts. And, and, and in this message, it says, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at Three in the afternoon. Now, there was a morning and there was an evening sacrifice, okay? And the, at three in the afternoon, the third, the third hour, they were headed up for this sacrifice for a time of prayer. And so they were heading, they were heading to, to this place with the intention of having prayer, but there was a divine appointment that was awaiting them. And you know what? I'm, I'm so grateful for divine appointments. We never know when they're going to come. You can even pray for divine appointments where God will cross your paths with someone that, that needs to hear a word of encouragement, hear a word about Jesus. Well, there was a man, and, and, and I, love, I love when, when Luke, who is highly detailed, he, he, he just says, a man. Now, you would have figured that Luke would have found out the name of this guy, but I think he just says a man because this is anyone, right? This is you, this is me, this is anyone. It's not male, female, it's everyone. This story is about everyone. And so now a man who was lame from birth, so this is a congenital birth defect, he is, he is at, at this place where... Peter and John are entering. He was lame from birth. He wasn't able to fully experience life. Here he is, 
sitting on the temple steps. And, and as it continues on, he was lame from birth, being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. Just a man, a man in need, a man who didn't know just how deep his need was. A man who was placed on the steps of the temple court where the, where the men would be going into the court to worship. He wasn't allowed in. He was placed close to that door. Why? Because at the third hour was the last sacrifice of the day and there would be a flow of traffic. He, he didn't sit there all day. He was placed there. And who knows? Did he have people that were friendly to him? Or did he have to pay somebody to take him and put him in the strategic place? We don't know. We know that... that he was not allowed in the temple because he was incomplete. Excluded. You know, so many of us deal with the feelings of not being good enough, not sufficient, not worth it. So many of us deal with the sense of being rejects. He was one of Israel's rejects begging. Begging. And he would say, alms, alms, have mercy, alms. And typically, people would just throw a coin. There's no personal contact. It was just kind of Flip a coin at this guy. Whether it went into the receptacle or not didn't matter much. He'd have to reach for it and get it into safekeeping. The rabbinic sources place it at this, at this entry to, um, to the court of the men. They're not absolutely sure, but he sees Peter and John coming up, and he, he looks at them and is expectant. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And as I said, probably <laughs> alms. Maybe he, he would just glance up and see if, if he heard footsteps, and then his head back down again. Now, the three pillars of the Jewish faith were the Torah, reading God's word, worship, and the third was giving and being generous to those who were in need, to show kindness. And this was considered a major tenet of the three pillars of the Jewish faith, to give. But you know, in so many ways, <laughs> the people of that time had become so jaded. And I, you know, I hate to say this because I drive by a lot of people uh, at entrances to freeways that are asking for something, right? Right. Uh, he was one of those. The beggar was placed there to make his living because he had no other way to exist, to survive, to eat. And so there he was at this, at this gate, the gate called Beautiful. Now, it's very interesting because the gate called Beautiful is not in the Old Testament for the temple. It's not in the New Testament for the temple, except for here in the book of Acts, where, where Dr. Luke names it twice. It's not in any Jewish literature and there are some clues from Josephus, but the placement of that gate is, is one places it on the east at the, um, at the Kidron Valley, which was a steep, dangerous ascent to the temple. The others say that Josephus says that it was by the court of the men, between the court of the women and the court of the men where the sacrifice would be done. Regardless, Luke calls this the gate beautiful. 
So Peter looked straight at him, and as did John, and then said to him, look at us. So he was looking down. He, he you know, do you know how, have you, have you had times where you just feel so out of place? You're doing something that you have to do, and you feel so dehumanized. He felt like his humanity, I'm sure, was stripped from him. And every day was the same. Every day was the same. <laughs> and the first thing that Peter does for this man is he says, look at me. Now, I wonder what it was to look up in the face of, of Peter, who had the Holy Spirit, who could preach in, in such a convincing way. When he looked into Peter's face, did he see the kindness the acceptance I mean what a gift that is to give people something of ourselves and there was Peter and John and this beggar I mean picture, picture this in your mind's eye what this mice must have been like and he says look at us so the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. <laughs> Little did he know what he was going to get. <laughs> he was thinking small. He was thinking some, you know, some coins. I mean, Peter and John didn't look like wealthy people. He had seen all kinds of wealthy people, and you know. He had no idea what he was about to receive. No idea. And I, I can't help but think how small we sometimes think when we go to our Heavenly Father. How small a reward, how small a return we're expecting when we go to the God of omnipotence who has, who has the whole universe that he's spoken into being. And we come into, into, his, into his presence in our prayers what are our expectations? Are they small like this beggar? Or are they, are they big in faith? I, you know, I, I, want, I want to pray bigger prayers, do you? Bigger prayers. Because, because I know that, that, that just what we've experienced is just a trickle of what God wants to pour out in answer to our prayers. Because when these meetings, when these meetings go on, it's going to be about our prayers. Oh yeah, we're going to shake people's hands. We're going to get to know people. We're going to share the word of God. But, but right from right from the from the Old Testament, where it says, "Not by might nor by power. It's not by our skillful words. It's not by oration. It's not by anything that we do that the real change takes place. It's not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit," declares the Lord. And our prayers unlock that that outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and that's where it all happens. That's where lives are really changed. And don't. Don't think it's about them out there. It's about our lives, too. When we are a part of, of this experience of sharing the Word of God in a meaningful way, it's for us, too, to relive those things, to rediscover them, and perhaps get more than what we knew before. That's what I'm praying for. I'm praying big prayers that God will reach out to Rainier and reach out to Kelso and Longview and, and Castle Rock and that he will, he will bring people who will hear God's word and their lives will be transformed. <laughs> well, Peter quickly dispels the expectations of this man by saying, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. <laughs> now, this is interesting. First of all, this is the first, first miracle of healing that is recorded in the book of Acts in the New Testament. 
And notice that he says, by the, by the, the power in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You notice that many times when I close off my prayer, I say, in the powerful name of Jesus, I pray. Because Jesus' name is powerful. His authority, he says, all authority on heaven, in heaven and on earth has been given to me, right? So his name is powerful. When we ask in his name, it's a powerful uh, petition to God to do something powerful. Because that's what God does. I mean, a God who could speak a whole creation into being, if we pray that he will do something of a recreation in us, right? And in those who God sends to us. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. <laughs> but, it's, but it's not done. It's not done yet. Because, <laughs> look, look what happens next. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. Look at, the, look at what's happening here. He, he pronounces it, and then he becomes a part of the miracle that God intended for this beggar. Because Peter becomes an agent of the miracle that God is working out, Peter takes his hand. And the power of God works through Peter in that physical contact, hand to hand. He helps him up. And this beggar who has been crippled from birth, who never dreamed of what it would be to walk, is suddenly being lifted to his feet. And he feels the strength entering his feet and his ankles. And, and he's whole. Whole. Transformed made whole. And Peter and John are witnessing this miracle. Now, there are two of them because only by the testimony of two witnesses can anything be proven. And God made sure that there were two of them there to witness this miracle because this man had been born with deformed feet that could not bear his weight. And suddenly, Peter reaches out to touch him. Now, you know, it just occurred to me, and I, <laughs> it just occurred to me now, and i got to share this thought. The, the last time I saw a hand going out to Peter was when he was sinking in the, in the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus lifted him up out of the water. Lord, help me, I sink, right? And Jesus, it says, immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and pulled him up. <laughs> now Peter's hand is reaching out to this beggar who never dreamed of being able to walk, never dreamed of being able to, to do the things that other people could do, never dreamed of what it would be to be whole. And Jesus does this for him. And we continue on, and it says, He jumped to his feet, because <laughs> I think once he was on him, it was like, Wow! <laughs> he jumped to his feet and began to walk, and then he went with them into the temple court went with them into the temple courts for the first time in his life, and he never expected that he would be able to do that. Went with them into the temple courts. Imagine. Imagine what that experience was for him. Always waiting outside the door. Never able to experience the promise of going into the temple with others. Do you realize that we can spend our whole life standing outside the door and not enter in? Always hearing about other people's experiences but never experiencing it ourselves. Never experiencing the power and the love and the presence of Jesus because we stand outside the door. This man walked through the temple, the temple gate, beautiful. <laughs> and we're told that, that he, was, he was walking and jumping 
and praising God. Praise God, look at me, I can walk, I'm walk, I'm leaping, I'm leaping, praising God, praising God. You know, he is just he has just experienced something that was supernatural. Because I can't help but believe that not only his feet were healed, but something happened inside of him where he experienced God's power in him and he became transformed. <laughs> oh, I love this. You know, liberation is, liberation is never as sweet as when we have lived a lifetime of bondage. You know? Liberation is never so sweet as when we have lived a lifetime of bondage. And when we, when we, when we receive that, when we receive that, we can't even begin to conceive of how much control it had in our lives until it's gone. <laughs> I mean, you don't know freedom until you've known bondage, right? And that is what Jesus can do for you. You may have crippled feet, but Jesus can restore whatever is broken in you. He can make the way for you. Now listen to what happens next. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. <laughs> you know, when God is present, how this world longs for authenticity and a real experience, not platitudes, not pretending, not, not speaking as if it's, it's there, but it's real. It's real. Lives transformed. Lives made complete. The church, this gathering, is the place where God is ready and willing to do that in us and in those who he will send to us. As I said two weeks ago, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants who had a vision, and some are still with us, but many have gone. But giants that, that, that envisioned this edifice, this beautiful building, but if it's only... If it's only a monument to the past. We've missed something incredible because we have this as a trust. This is a vehicle to the future to make a difference in this area of the world where there is so much poverty and brokenness and addiction and, and, and disillusionment and trouble and the world is getting worse. And it will. But Jesus is always real. And he is always there. And he will go with us through whatever we have to go through. And I thank God for that. We're told that people were astonished. And while the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to the... Wait, he's, he's in there leaping and walking and praising God. And look at them leaping, I'm leaping. And people are running to him in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. Well, next what happens is really interesting. Peter, Peter preaches a barn burner because now all the Jewish leaders are there and he's saying, hey, you know who did this? This is with Jesus, the one you crucified, right? And he, he preaches this sermon and I'll tell you what, there was some squirming that was going on there. But he ends his sermon this way. He says, By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know has made strong, has been made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can see. 
He was the evidence. He was the testimony. He was the measure of the power of Jesus that is able to be released. And you know, we've been told that in the last days before Jesus comes, there will be greater power than this for us and through us. <laughs> greater power is coming, and we have the privilege and the opportunity to be a part of it. But I'm not done yet. Because I want to look a bit deeper into the story behind the story. This is really, this is really kind of use your sanctified imagination here. Remember the gate called beautiful, right? Nowhere else is it mentioned in the Old Testament or the New Testament outside of this story. Nowhere else is it mentioned in Jewish literature. And there's some foggy, hazy uh, statements from Josephus, the historian of that time. But the gate beautiful. Remember the part of the man that was crippled? It was his feet. And I started putting together beautiful feet. Feet? Beautiful. Oh! And all of a sudden I remembered, oh, that's, in, that's in Isaiah. And, 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 and so Dr. Luke, is he, is he putting, this, putting this in here? Isaiah, Isaiah says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Beautiful feet. <laughs> Walking and leaping and praising God. Yeah. But, but here's the point. The Jewish church had crippled feet. They were told, they were told to go into the world and make, make believers, introduce God. They had, the, they had the wonder of the word of God. And they, well, Jesus said it in, in pretty plain terms. He says, you search over heaven and earth to make one disciple. And when you do, you make him twice the son of hell that you are. Right? They weren't proclaiming good news. They were proclaiming bad news. And, and people were falling away from God because the religion was an empty shell of what God had intended for it to be. It was... It was it was a whited sepulcher filled with dead men's bones. It had lost the glory and the beauty of God as a tender, loving God. It made him harsh and exacting and, and had made it a, a list of rules. I hate religion, but I love Jesus. You know, religion has ruined a lot of people following rules but Jesus and his word and his and his presence and the power of the holy spirit is is what revolutionizes us into an organic relationship a love relationship that fundamentally transforms who we are but it's not done yet paul <laughs> paul who as I go through uh, the book of Romans, I'm seeing the struggle of Paul. He's, he's relating things that he learned because of what he had to unlearn and how painful it was. And he shares this in Romans chapter 14, verse 15. He says, how then can, we, how, how then can we, they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can, they, how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The Jewish faith had disintegrated. It had gotten crippled useless feet. But I believe that, that Dr. Luke, who was so meticulous about details, is using this beautiful gate and the gospel being, being lived out in the life of this man, the gate beautiful 
and crippled feet made whole. That this was the birth of the church in this miracle. That suddenly the New Testament church had beautiful feet to carry the good news into the world. And it did. People gave all they had because they believed with all their hearts. And it became real. My friends, <laughs> we have such an opportunity. We have such an opportunity to share this compelling message with those around us. As we, as we prepare for this, this series of meetings, we have a great opportunity. Now maybe your feet are crippled and you need Jesus. Maybe you know somebody who could desperately use the good news of the gospel. And you know, by God's power, I pray that this church would have beautiful feet filled with people with beautiful feet. And so let me pray over us. Lord God, I pray in the powerful name of Jesus of Nazareth <laughs> that you would grant us this that you would pour your spirit into us and bring healing into us, that we might be transformed. Lord God, we know that you want to answer this prayer. Lord, I pray that, that the barriers, the, the blockages, the, the excuses, <laughs> the deceptions would be, would be washed away in the light of your love. I pray, Jesus. I pray for the power of your spirit would be washed over us, Lord, and transform us fundamentally from the inside out. And I pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Amen. My dear friends, I just am so grateful to God for you. Each one of you is a candle that God has lit for his glorious purposes. And no matter where you are, <laughs> I got to say, <laughs> one of the things I started saying to my daughter, our firstborn, <laughs> my mother-in-law told me, because I was afraid to be a dad. I was afraid to be a dad because I didn't grow up with a dad. And she said, as long as your children always know that you love them. So when, when my daughter was about two years old, all of a sudden I got this inspiration, and Cheryl and I did this every night along with our prayers. We said, I said to her, Rebecca, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, Daddy will always love you, and that will never change. Our daddy loves us, no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, and that will never change. So as you go from this place, go as people of hope, go as people of light, go as people of truth, go as people transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Go out into the world and make a difference with beautiful feet. Amen.